Hello, welcome to the show. Um, so it's Thursday, I think. Um, we are going to talk about some stuff. So knowing that I would have to <clears throat> end up doing something online, I decided to skip section 3.7 uh later for today because it's a, a very it's a very festive section it's called derivatives in the natural sciences or something and i think it's a pretty lame section <laughs> it's trying to make a point it's very correct in what it's saying but it's just making its point very very weekly um it's trying to rates of change in the natural and social sciences um right <clears throat> it's not it has a lot of examples um and they're really lame and they're really lame for a very good reason which is that we don't know anything about anything um so my point and Stuart's point, derivatives are very useful. Um, the problem, the problem with this statement is that uh, to understand or to use um, derivatives that appear in, you name something, you have to understand that thing. So whatever this is, let's say engineering. So I can't really, teach you anything about engineering, um, which means that I don't have a lot of good examples about derivatives in engineering. Um, but I mean, there is, there, so there is a reason why, what, what, I mean, I think there are many reasons. One of the big reasons that derivatives appear all the time in science is that, I don't know what to say, a bunch a bunch of laws in, I wanna say science, but I don't just mean natural sciences. Um, they have this form. If stuff is some way, then stuff will change in some other way. For example, if I put a magnet here, um, it will move this way. Or, I don't know. <clears throat> if the solar system, I have to go with physics because is the, is the thing I'm less ignorant about, which doesn't make me not ignorant. If the solar system, planets are in some position and have some velocity really, um, they will accelerate this way. So it's always, there are so many things, so many laws that look like if something uh, is like this, then it's going to change in some other way. And I mean, 
most useful laws have some sort of measurement. They're not just, and there's some exceptions, but a lot of them tell you that some numbers are equal. And the way you measure change is just almost always a derivative. Um, often respect to time. Sometimes, well, yeah. Sometimes it's acceleration, which is also a derivative of respect to time, the derivative of velocity. Um, so let me just quickly mention what the book says. Um, The book mentions velocity as an example. Of course, you know that velocity is a derivative of position. But it kind of means that anytime you want to study something that moves and you want to understand where it is, you're going to have to, there's going to be a derivative there. Um, unless, I mean, unless it's moving at a, at a constant speed, and then you know, probably know what its position is at every moment. but that's not ever true. Um, and of course, then there's acceleration. Which is the derivative of velocity over time. Um, and then he has like a couple more run sort of ideas. But I want to make my point um, without trying to explain any science, because I would fail at that, um, that there are derivatives everywhere. And lucky for me, there's, there's this Wikipedia page, which is just really going to bring my point home. So just a Wikipedia page with all the laws of science that they could think. Uh, just overview the property. So here we go, lots of physics. <clears throat> uh, there's a bunch of laws saying stuff is conserved. Um, so we're not gonna understand the equations exactly, but that doesn't mean we're not gonna understand them at all. Can't throw, oh yeah, I can, I can, yeah. So, um, take the first one. This one is saying, oh, is there? Um, whenever you have, whenever you have a liquid or a gas, um, if you have a liquid, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a, there's a crap ton of work on what it does because it turns out it's pretty important. Um, you want to know where the gas is going inside of a car. You want to know. Uh, you want to know what gases do. In, you know because when things explode, and that's just gases moving around. Um, you want to know how the wind that powers your turbines works, or the water that powers your turbines. You, I mean, basically, uh, this is pretty important. And I guess that the first law um, of the evolution of a liquid is that the total mass doesn't change. The, well, this is what it, it's trying to tell us here. So the total mass is constant. Uh, and that doesn't sound like there's a derivative anywhere. But then you look at the uh, work, the column equation, and and what you see is that what they wrote is and is they wrote so this is so well. There's a lot of kinds of derivatives, but they're all they're all the same derivative that you've seen. Only there's so many we need different letters. <clears throat> but here, what really? This is a derivative, even though it's not a D. Like we usually see, this is also a derivative. Um, there's a bunch of letters flowing around here, which we're not used to, but my point is not that we can understand this. My point is that we need derivatives to understand this. Um, even, 
if you look at this, it's not, it's not taking, so you could say that the derivative of mass is, is zero because the total mass is constant and the derivative of a constant is zero. But that's not even the law that's written there because it's trying to say what mass you have at every point. Um, and of course, because you're thinking, you know, you have a glass of water or a gas, I guess, I don't know if water has the same mass everywhere or you can get compressed, I have no idea. But you have a, um, some gas and it's, uh, you're trying to find the density. So at a particular point, of course the mass just at a point is zero. So what you look is at a tiny amount of mass in a tiny amount of space. Um, and guess what? Um, you make the uh, denominator approach zero and then you get a derivative and you call that the density. So there's a derivative in that formula, but also the, the thing we're taking the derivative of is a derivative. And this is also a derivative, which is sort of telling us, what it's telling you is that if the mass at a, if the, if the mass at a point is changing, it means it's going somewhere. That is, this is what this law is saying. And then you look to the next row and it's exactly the same thing except with charge. This is saying, so now this is charge density. So I don't know how many electrons you have in your fist. Uh, it's saying if the, if the number of, if the amount of charge somewhere is changing, it's because it's somewhere else. That is exactly what that equation is saying. Uh, this is the same thing about heat or energy. Again, exactly the same thing. Uh, that's not getting to the quantum mechanics um, before I get canceled. Uh, we're not knowing my stuff. I mean, quantum mechanics. So you, in quantum mechanics, stuff is all of a sudden not in a concrete place, but sort of, yes, some probability of being somewhere at a, a given moment, but the total probability of being, if you add up all the places, the total probability is one. So the total probability is conserved. Uh, then you have all this stuff. I don't know if you will see this as an engineer. You have, um, so this is mechanics. This is just how stuff moves when there's a force involved. Um, and you have sort of two ways to look at mechanics, I think, which are Lagrangian mechanics and Hamilton mechanics. And Lagrangian mechanics, so when, when physicists, they like to put a dot on top of, of things to represent derivative respect to time because it takes so many derivatives. That is how small a symbol they need. Um, and you see a function in terms of the derivative because it involves speed. Uh, and then you take the derivative of that function and you try to solve something. And then you have Hamiltonian me mechanics where you take some other derivatives. Um, I mean, it's just derivatives everywhere. Um, then you have, well, then from here you can get, I don't know, everything about how liquids and solids bounce on each other. Um, all right, so I guess then we move on to relativity. This is just, I mean, this is just all derivatives. Uh, here's a literal Ds, but this crazy thing here is just a million derivatives all in one place. Look at them. Uh, this is just, I don't think there's a single thing here that's not a derivative, probably a two. Um, I guess that's a constant. <clears throat> Um, here you have the equations of gravity. Equations of gravity somehow also are full of derivatives. You have um, one telling you how the gravitational field changes. Uh, another one tells you that it's 
has to do with mass density, which again, a derivative appears. Um, I have no idea what this is. I just, I can just tell you there's derivatives. Uh, you have the, the law of gravity that I gave you in the quiz. Look at Kepler's laws. Kepler's laws don't have derivatives. I don't know if you've heard of Kepler's laws, but Kepler's laws tell you what, what you see here, it tells you how planets move and they come from Kepler staring at measurements of where the planets were each day for probably years. And then coming up with honestly, a pretty, like pretty impressive um, planets moving in ellipse. Like how can you tell that looking at this guy? So the guy realized that planets move in ellipse well, I, that's not, I don't know if he did it first and someone else, I'm not sure. Um, that he would tell you the speed at which they go, but the thing is Kepler didn't have derivatives, which is the reason you don't see derivatives here. Uh, a little bit later, Newton invented, and some other people invented derivatives and realized that you could just explain gravity um, in terms of the force, which tells you the acceleration, which is a derivative. And I guess there's no derivatives here. But if the planets are in a place, I can tell you the derivative of their position. Um, and this way, you turn three laws into one, and you also explain why apples fall on your head. Uh, all right, this is more or less my big chemistry. <clears throat> First law of thermodynamics. Everything here is a derivative. The derivative of the internal energy is the derivative of the heat that you contain and uh, the work that you've done. That might not be a derivative depending on how you see it. Uh, second law of thermodynamics says the entropy increases. I mean, that's a derivative being positive, but also I have no idea what entropy is, but I'm pretty sure it's a derivative. Uh, do you see where I'm going? You notice there's a lot of derivatives. Um, Maxwell's equation uh, tells you everything that elect um, electrons and magnets do. And they all look like derivatives. Um, they tell you that uh, an electrical field makes a charge uh, move around, uh, they, uh, which means that they affect the derivative of position. They tell you that a uh, that, um, magnetic field also affects the derivative of position and, and the acceleration of a charge. And they also depend on how it's moving. And then you have the, the laws of induction that say that when you change a magnetic field, uh, you can make uh, you can make a current and the change in the magnetic field is the derivative of the magnetic field over time. And so on. <clears throat> quantum mechanics, I have no idea about quantum mechanics, but I know that there is such a thing as a, as a wave equation. The wave equation describes whatever quantum mechanics is. And I know that there is this equation, Schrodinger's equation, which says if the wave equation is in some position, its derivative is this. So I don't understand the symbols, but I know it's telling me how the thing changes over time if I know what it's like. Um, I should be, the thing is there's no Wikipedia page for the loss of engineering. Maybe engineering, engineers don't have loss. Um, chemistry. Um, I don't know the many chemical laws, but the one the book likes is the one where um, you look at the speed at which the react a reaction is changing. You know, um, from a theoretical point of view, it might be great to know that a reaction uh, happens, but uh, from a practical point of view, if for the engineering majors among you. Um, I'm going to say 
uh, it, it matters how fast it goes. If it goes too fast, everything might explode. If it goes too slow, you're, you're not doing anything. Who cares? So, um, so this is concern, I don't know which, what, I don't know what equation I'm looking for. Oh, here we go. Okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna follow this. But the point is, if you have, what's a, what's a chemical reaction? I wish someone would answer. Um, I remember this one. If you have, <laughs> Ooh, what's happening? If you have, let me write, right? Oh, I see what I'm doing. Um, if you have methane, which is the stuff in couple farts, I believe, and you put it in oxygen and probably you heat it up, you burn it and you get um, water and carbon dioxide. And you probably get two molecules of water for every um, molecule of methane. So what is the speed? So I'm not gonna tell you how to compute anything, but what I'm gonna tell you is that the speed of this reaction, if you, if you don't wanna talk about it, if you wanna know you know, it's going to depend on a lot of factors, but you probably want to know the speed. So you want to know if you're going to die in a methane explosion. It's probably there's another way to die. It's the derivative of it's the derivative of the concentration of well any of these really over time. Um, if this reaction is going, is consuming methane and making something else, that would, that would make this, I mean, then you have less and less methane uh, because it's turning into water and carbon dioxide. So that there is gonna be negative, but how negative it is, um, is gonna, um, how negative it is going to tell you how fast it's happening. And, and then you realize that the speed is just never, never constant. So, you know, linear equations are not going to work here it's because the, the, the more methane you have, the faster it goes. So really it slows down over time. And sometimes you have, you reach the thing that I vaguely remember. See if I can find it. Sometimes you have. There's no example. Okay, All right. the, the one example I remember. Sometimes you have reactions. Well, all reactions go both both ways, right? So you have water, and water sometimes turns into two things. And these two things sometimes meet and combine into water. And really both reactions are happening and, and nothing is changing. And why is, um, you know, you have a glass of water, the quantity of water is not changing or the quantity of protons or hydroxide ions. Uh, but the, the, the reason for the equilibrium is that uh, one reaction uh, is as fast as the other. In other words, if you ever find, you know, how much of something you have when you reach the equilibrium, what you really found is when two derivatives equal each other. Maybe you can get away with not knowing about the derivatives for this one, but 
<sighs> Playing steel stands. Um, oh wait. It gets um, um, there's few and fewer as I go down. Um, I'm a biologist, I guess I like a lot of rules. I've, I've clicked a few of this and seen derivatives. Um, there's another one in biology that the book likes to mention. So, I mean, there's a lot of things in biology, it's just one example, but I would say ecology is pretty important. So you wanna know how many rabbits are in the forest, how many snowshoe hares, and how many kind of lynx, lynxes um you want to know if they're going to, if either is going to go extinct and you're kind of measuring how many there are every year but the thing is in practice you just want to take the derivatives even even if you're not making the increment of time approach zero um and what happens is that what are you doing? Why? Oh. The derivative in the rabbit population it basically has to do with how many rabbits there are and how many lynxes are eating those rabbits. So it's brought, well, it's here. Um, it's something like How many rabbits are born minus how many are eaten by lynxes? And how many are eaten by lynxes is going to have to do with how many lynxes there are. And how much the lynx population grows probably depends on how many rabbits they eat. and probably how many lynxes there are. So what you end up with with, the, if, with the derivatives, you end up with in, I think this is like the simplest model there, there is, and you end up with equations involving derivatives. And I'm guessing this graph is here because it matches pretty well whatever this equation predicts. Um, right, this is the most engineering example I have, but it's pretty trending. So there's this thing called AI. Um, and a lot of, so AI is where you tell a computer, you give a computer information, like a drawing, and you don't tell you what it is. And the computer matches that with some pattern and says, that's a rain. And one pretty common way of doing this is with a neural network. So how's it, how's this go? The way this goes is you have some neurons and each has some, so here comes the information, which is just numbers. Um, you know, maybe it's, it's numbers describing the color of each pixel in the image. And then you, you do something which basically is a lot of linear equations. Um, so if you have if you if you have some numbers com coming in, you you get some other numbers coming out. And maybe you repeat the process, maybe you mix them together, you know. It's called a network because you have all these arrows going everywhere um, and things getting mixed together in ways that we don't really understand. Because the good thing about the computer is you can put a thousand neurons in there and tell it to do a thousand multiplication and, and it does it like nothing. So, uh, and then at the end, when you're, or when you're tired of computing, uh, you get an answer, which is also some numbers. And then you ask, uh, so what you want to do is find the correct things to do in there. 
um, to get the correct answers. And a way that you often do it is you give it a bunch of images of brains and rabbits and you tell it to tell brains and rabbits apart and then you, you say, how could I change these numbers to make it more accurate? And how could I change these numbers? You see where it's going, right? <laughs> um, I said the word change. I mean, you don't need to invent this, right? Because it's, it's all done by someone. Uh, you, you just you take all your information, you look at how well you did, you look at these weights are the numbers that say which, you know, how the input is processed into output. And then you look at what you got. And then what you do is you take a trillion derivatives and you do stuff with them, use the chain rule, uh, because you're putting your thing through several different machines, which is nothing more than composing functions. And I really try to find the, the max of the accuracy, which is something that we've already kind of seen unit derivatives for. So, you know, it's obviously, Everything I'm talking about is complicated, but at the core, you're saying if I change the little numbers, how am I going to change? How is it going to get better or worse? Um, your your question and your answer are derivatives. So, <sighs> derivatives are important. Um, I don't know if this is convincing, but. Honestly, uh, I think it was more convincing than the book. <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to leave it there. All right, see you in the next lecture. <laughs>